Hey, Nathan, uh, how many used cars we bought? TFO? Yeah. 50 or oh, yeah, 40? Way, way too many. Well, I mean, if you think about how many we buy per year, and we've been around for over 11 years now, yeah, I think we're close to 50. Well, welcome to this episode of TFL Talk. And we have a packed show, Nathan, just a packed show, because we're going to talk about the top 10 used cars you should never, and that's with a capital N-E-V-E-R, buy. Uh, and we'll give you good reasons for that. But... We've got more. That's right. Recently, I had an opportunity to go out to Florida to a place called ECD in Kissimmee, Florida, which has a Land Rover Defender powered by a Tesla powertrain. And I'm going to tell you all about that. I can't wait, Nathan. Also, Nathan, we're going to play a game. Uh, our friend uh, Rachel Alfonso just sent us this book. It's a kid's book. Oh, look at that. What cars What cars say? say so you, you, can, you can look through there uh, and you could. Like have your young car lovers in your lives uh, learn to read. But more importantly, there's an audio file of different car exhaust notes. So I'm going to test you, Nathan. All right. I'm going to find out if you can actually tell what car exhaust note is what car. Oh, man, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. But, um, yeah, I'm an old man. My ears are old. So you guys might do better than I am. Here. So I'll tell you what. When you do it, I'll give it a second to see if they can figure it out. Then I'll try to answer it. All right. I'm gonna get, uh, we'll start with one right now. Okay, okay. okay let's this, fire This up. is one of three, okay? All right. This is either a Mini mm -hmm. Cooper. I'll make this easy, okay? Okay. A Mustang GT500 mm -hmm. or a Corvette. Okay. Uh, okay. So Mini, Mustang. Actually, the, the Corvette and the Mustang are very similar. So yeah, I was going to say. Let's, let's change it around. So let's go uh, Mini, Mustang, or... How about um, how about a Mercedes? No, let's do Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce uh, looks like a uh, ghost. Rolls Royce ghost it is. Okay, let's do it. Okay, all right, here we go. Uh -huh. So one of the three. Okay, I'm gonna give you three, two, one. Here we go. Okay, that's re that's really easy. It's what the Mustang GT3. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah one that for is, one. Yeah, that's that's easy. All right, all right. Well, we'll do these every time we do one of these top tens. We'll do another one. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And then, of course, I'm going to do a Roman's rant in the middle of this top ten. Here we go. So buckle up for that, folks. Uh, before we get started, really quickly, wanted to say thank you very much to our Patreon subscribers, guys. Thank you. Without your help, we wouldn't be here. Yep, TFL, uh, which is Patreon slash TFL uh, mm -hmm. car. Uh, if you want to help support this show, uh, please do so. And, of course, if you're looking for all of our uh, automotive news, views, and reviews, go to tfl-studios.com mm -hmm. where we uh, put our stories, our podcasts, our TikToks, um, and, of course, uh, our videos all in one place for you. Make it easy. All right, let's get going with this lift. Number 10 lift list, Nathan. Number 10. And, uh, you know, Tommy made this list for us. So, yes, he did. So thank you, Tommy, very much uh, for doing this. Uh, he's not here because uh, he's filming a classics video. I thought he was getting a dragon tattoo on his back. I hope he's not getting it. Okay, so uh, we had different <laughs> intel. Okay, I, no, no, I, 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 I totally had it wrong. Well, should, should we spill the beans and tell him? Yeah, let's spill the beans. Tell him what he's filming. We, we bought an excursion. Yes, yeah, we, we have a Ford Excursion with a V10, baby. Oh, and it's going to be part of a pro. We can't give everything yeah, we away. we can talk about it. You want to talk yeah, about it? Okay, yeah, sure. I, you know what I hate? That's one of my, uh, like, uh, uh, rants where, you know, people like uh, a lot of podcasts, they say, I can't talk about it because it's embargoed or coming next week. I hate that. If you're going to bring it up, let's just spill the beans. So tell, okay. them, tell them what we're doing. We've done a series called uh, No Payment Needed, right? Right. We've done a couple series technically yeah. with uh, No Payment Needed. And the first series we did was with 1,500 trucks, essentially for $5,000. And then we move to a much less expensive series of trucks for $2,500. We, this is very we different. Call, we call that one for a few bucks less. Right. And now this uh, next set of three vehicles that we're buying in the No Pavement Needed series is going to be called Go Big. Yeah, that's right. So we are going full size and then some with these uh, SUVs. And the first one that we bought, and I'm sure you can guess what the other one's going to be at the very least. The first one we bought is the Ford Excursion. Not the Expedition. No, 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 no. The Excursion. And for those of you out there who don't know what that is, essentially it is a heavy-duty seven- or eight-passenger, very large SUV that unfortunately was discontinued oh, about 10 years ago. 
Um, longer. Was, longer? It, was it the first gen that we got when 2008 or nine? I think I, I got rid of it. The, the one we have, the, we have a 2000 that we bought. Yeah, and that was just that, that one ended in 2004. I don't know if they did. did no, they, they kept one? on going. Did I, they? Yeah, they kept on going for a little bit longer, I think. But the point is, is that basically a uh, heavy duty uh, version of a uh, uh, SUV. And this one, now you could get them with a diesel, but this one has the big V10. And, and the reason we didn't get the diesel is the cheapest one I find is 17,000. Diesels are highly sought after. Yes. Uh, I saw they go from anywhere from seventeen to twenty-seven thousand. Yes, and that's in rough shape in some cases. And, and our budget for uh, three of these is, and we're not going to talk about the other two until we buy them. Yeah, it's right. Ten thousand. So what we want to do is basically uh, Andre, Nathan, and myself are going to each get one of these, and then we're going to take it around the White Room Trail and turn them into overlanding rigs. Now we're not going to do that after we go on the trail. We're going to do that before we do the trail. So hopefully they'll be ready to go. And um, we're very excited about this because it gives us an opportunity to drive some trucks that we haven't had a chance to really get our hands on that you guys have requested. So that is coming up in the future. We are beginning filming literally right now. Yeah, and the hard part about it is, of course, you know, a ten thousand dollar budget for each one of these. So um, you have to come in way under that budget because you have to have some money left over to, to actually convert it to an overlanding rig and maybe fix it. <laughs> and maybe fix it. <laughs> so they, you know, you, that may sound like oh, 10, 10 grand. That, yes, it is a lot of dough if you're getting like a, a Toyota Corolla. But if you're getting a really big truck, which are super hot right now, yeah, the the slim it's slim pickings. So, yes. So can I tell you the story of this excursion? Yes, please. One, one owner truck, uh, and Tommy's doing a video uh, on the Classics Channel mm -hmm. once again. TFL Deck Studios. If you want to see it, uh, I was going to pick it up last week, uh -huh. uh, but the owner calls me right, and he's like, uh, "Yeah, I've had a little issue. I was going to, I was taking it to get smog emissions tested, which is great because mm -hmm. he got it for us. Uh, that was one of the things I said I needed done because I didn't want to deal with that. Uh, with one hundred and seventy thousand miles on a truck." It can have issues. Yeah, they might. It have. So he lives in Conifer. Uh, nice guy, Jay. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, and he lives in the mountains. And he said he was uh, taking it down his driveway uh, when all of a sudden, uh, and this is a very steep driveway because mm -hmm. I went there, the pedal went to the floor. Oy. Yeah. Yeah. Pedal went to the floor. <laughs> That's not good. That's not good. No. <laughs> On a big, I think this thing weighs like 6,500 pounds. Yeah, it's, they're really, really they're, big. They're, I mean, it's it's a heavy-duty frame. It's basically a heavy-duty truck. I, I want to say it's the biggest, the excursion is the biggest SUV ever built. The longest and biggest, heaviest, everything. I would say heaviest. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's definitely one of the biggest, that's for sure. Anyway, so he said... <laughs> <laughs> it luckily it stopped before it ran into his uh, into his camper mm -hmm. uh, and uh, went underneath. No brake fluid. Oops. Oops. So apparently he said one of the, uh, the it's, it's got the metal uh, brake lines. One mm. of them rusted through. And <laughs> oh, okay. So he had that fixed. Which is really cool that he had it fixed before we got it. Yeah, before we got it. So uh, the brakes do work on this on this bad boy, uh, but it's a really cool truck, and I can't wait to actually, uh, um, well. Take it to Toby and find out everything that's wrong with it. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be yeah, very it, expensive. Look, look we, we know that too. and it's But that's half the fun is that you guys get to discover with us whether or not we bought a turkey or perhaps something that's worthwhile. And in our last one, we actually love the trucks that we bought so much that we still haven't sold or gotten rid of any of them, with the exception of the fact that I bought Tommy's Jeep. So that kind of tells you how we like, you know, can fall in love with these things. And there's a video on classics with your reasoning for that. As yes, well. indeed, there is. All right, so let's get to it. Number ten, Nathan. Uh, I'll go through it, and we, you, you kind of uh, give the color commentary. Okay, uh, so that's what I do. Okay, so number ten, and I completely agree with this one. It's the Audi All Road, built from 1999 to 2005, called the C5 Generation. It had the uh, or has the 2.7 liter twin turbo V6. Uh, it has, uh, well, issues uh, with uh, the transmission, and it has issues with air suspension. In other words, anything that can go wrong with this car will go wrong with this car. Yes, and you know what the real shame is? I loved these cars. Oh, I, I did too. Them, I they did were too. the coolest thing. It yeah. was like a James Bond car. I mean, it had a suspension that was adjustable. It had a really good all-wheel drive, basically four-wheel drive system. You could get them with a manual transmission. That turbo was fast. There were so many things to love about them, but unfortunately, if you buy one of these, you are going to spend an awful lot of money maintaining it. Yeah, you will. Lot. You will be underwater immediately. Oh, immediately. Because the, the, the engine is guaranteed to uh, implode. I think the head gaskets go on these things. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, and turbo issues. Yeah, the transmission is guaranteed to implode, <laughs> and the air suspension will fail. So here's an interesting thing. Mm. I was working with Tommy on this list last night, uh, and he, th he, he thought that this should be number 10 on our list, and I agreed. Uh, and then I added a car that he did not. Uh, so this is going to be a bonus car. I'm going to give it to you right now. Oh, you're going to give it to an Okay. No. Yeah, uh, a Disco 2. 
<laughs> really? Yeah, uh, uh, a Land Rover Disco too. And the reason I thought of that is because it is also guaranteed to have, uh, well, it's got the three Amigos. So uh, the ABS goes out, the air suspension fails on it, uh, and the engine is guaranteed to lose the head gasket as well. So uh, it is a complete and utter basket case. We've owned one. Uh, our air suspension was replaced. Yes. Or regular coil springs, which is nice. That was that helped. That helped. Uh, but we did have the th- we did get the three amigos, uh, the three little lights or three little trouble lights that light mm-hmm. up. Basically, the ABS goes out. It had the very first form of. Uh, Land Rover's train management, mm-hmm. uh, and that takes uh, a dump when the t- three amigos come out. Right, uh, and then of course the head gasket had been replaced on ours, so that was also sorted. But that is another car that is becoming hugely popular. We sold ours; we bought it for like five and a half back in the day. Sold it for something similar, and now they're on you know bring a trailer for up to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for clean ones. And there's no such thing as a clean one. They will all magnificently fail. Wonderful they- vehicles when they're working, but they will all take a dump on your carpet. So a consumer tidbit of advice for you guys is that if you decide to go looking for one, see if they've actually done this maintenance in advance. So that way, at least you might have a decent vehicle for a little while. And by the way, off-road, they are savage. They are amazingly good. So there's an awful lot to like about them. And going back to the Audi All-Road, actually that thing could easily be one of the best all-road slash all-wheel drive vehicles of its time, with the exception of reliability. Yeah. Uh, and then there, there, On the Land Rover, Nathan, there is a workaround. If you want a Land Rover, if you love the brand like we do, mm-hmm. uh, and you want to use one, forget the Disco 1, forget the Disco 2. Tommy loves the Disco 1, loves the Disco 2. Go for the LR3, which is the next one. Right. Make sure you get the 2006, 2009, most reliable Land Rover probably ever built. Uh, it's got just incredible off-road uh, um, well, we took it around the White Ribbon Trail, and everybody fought for it because the air suspension, which will fail. All air suspension fails. Yeah, eventually. But, that, but it will not fail in a catastrophic way like the uh, Disco 2. Uh, it, you know, I mean, the, the, let's talk about air suspension failures, right? So a couple things that can fail in air suspension. The cheapest is the little compressor. Mm-hmm. That's like a $500 replacement. <clears throat> or even the lines in some cases will blow. The lines can blow, uh, and then, of course, the airbags. Yes. Those are expensive. Those are, well, because the whole unit has to come out, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then with the Audi, what blows are the little seals, that, that whole, and then, then you got to replace the whole The whole, whole thing's got to come out. It's, yeah. it's not some little component that's easily replaced in most cases. And you usually have to go to somebody who specializes in German cars or Audi, and both will be expensive. Let's move on, though, to what's pictured behind me. For those of you who cannot see something I'm very familiar with, the first generation, and in this case, the 2011 Nissan Leaf. Yeah, you own one of these. No, well, I have a later <laughs> one, and I'll explain that in a second. And I do understand exactly what's going on here. So let's talk about why it's number nine on our list. Yeah, so uh, first year of the Leaf uh, suffered from major battery degradation. Uh, the 24 kilowatt hour battery had little to no range when it was new. Uh, and when it gets old, it has uh, less than little to no range. <laughs> so I think the original <laughs> range was like 60 miles. A little bit more, but yeah. uh, But uh, the problem happened when the new battery displayed 12 bars, Nissan would warranty it under 9 bars, but they're no longer in warranty, of course. Um, And so what you end up with is a car that you may end up with, I don't know, what do you think, 25 miles of range if you're lucky? Uh, Some of them can go a little bit over 30. Actually, there's a guy up in Canada who's been documenting it, and he says that he still can get over 40 kilometers, which, you know, is not too bad. The problem is, is that the tech back then had had to evolve, and it did evolve, and they started making better batteries progressively. So the newer the Nissan Leaf, essentially, the better the battery is going to be. Yeah, the new ones, the um, pluses, I think it's called, yeah, right? Plus. Those go up to 240 miles, right. but they have one major flaw, and that is they're air-cooled. They're, they don't have a proper heat pump like some of the other ones. Yeah, most like Tesla batteries, most electric car batteries are climate controlled. Batteries like you and me, Nathan, it mm-hmm. likes to be between, I don't know, 68 to 72 degrees. That's when it's happiest. That's when it's got its most life. Mm-hmm. If it gets cold, it loses, um, well, it loses uh, range. And if it gets hot, uh, it tends to degrade very quickly. And especially in places like Phoenix where people bought these, those batteries were shot. The, the warranty lasted up to eight years, but a 2011 now is, of course, out of warranty. Mm-hmm. And if you buy one of these cars, the car itself is great. Yeah, it's actually a really good it's car. It's a good car. It's yeah. a really good car, but you will be underwater because the replacement cost of the battery is more than the value of the car. Even used batteries on the base models can go well over 2500 bucks all the way to about $6,000, depending on what you're getting. However... 
if you go a few years newer, like the one I got, which is essentially the same body design as the one behind me, first generation. However, I wanted to get the bigger battery, which is the 30 kilowatt hour battery, which was available in 2016. And you could even get it on a base model, which is exactly what I did. Now that one, it's still big and fat in the warranty. It has so far survived outdoors in two Colorado winters and hasn't lost too much of its range. So it's already proving to be a good car. And here's the thing about it, Roman, that is a very big positive. That car is tough. My daughter has found <laughs> every curb in southern Denver. She has bounced off a tree. She got it stuck on a tree root once, on a root of a tree. She's knocked off all the hubcaps on it. She's managed to really beat it up, and it still comes back for more. The car has cost me $0 for maintenance, with the exception of me trying to get the air conditioner fixed, which is fine without it. Air conditioning system is kind of complicated on these cars. Uh, long story there. Bottom line is that the newer the battery the better the tech is, but it still is not regulated like these other high-end batteries in other vehicles like Tesla and Rivian. Yeah, not air-cooled. Um, mm -hmm. Not mean not uh, climate-controlled, but air-cooled. Not, not in, in the proper so, sense. So, yeah, just avoid that first 2011. If you yeah, they're the first couple years, I, I would bad, say. Yeah. yeah, let's move on to something that is an utter basket case. Well, I actually know somebody. On, oh, oh, we're going to do another one of these. Another one of these. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm going to make this... Uh, I'm going to give you a choice. You can see the little cars. Can you see them here? I, 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 I yeah. honestly, I'm not wearing my glasses. All right. Um, All right. That's what they look like. So I'm, I'm just going to go down. So Mini, Porsche 911, or Rolls Royce. Okay. okay. You ready? Yep. Oops, I hit this. All right, here we go. Mini, Porsche 911, or Rolls Royce. What car say? Um, okay, well, <laughs> with that, that's probably, that's Mini because it costs nope, a lot of money. Not. That's the Rolls Royce. So it's Ching for the... Let me do the mini. Let's see what the mini sounds like. I'm curious. I haven't done these, so I'm, I'm, okay. I'm learning about these. Yeah, that sounds kind of like a mini, a more modern mini, actually. You want to hear the Porsche? Sure. All right. Hold on. Dude, yeah, see, I would have gotten this. The cha-ching is not fair. <laughs> How would I would have? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't I, expect that, dude. Cha-ching. <laughs> Crying out loud. Well, you know what? It would cost you a lot of cha-ching. To buy a new battery for a Nissan Leaf or to fix an Audi All-Road suspension. Well, so there well, you go. That's well, how. It... There is a Pugani Huayra and uh, <laughs> and a Bugatti Veyron here, or maybe it's a Chiron. It's, I think it's a Chiron. Uh, well, it's gonna be really okay. One's a twelve. Those should be ka-ching. <laughs> yeah, those will be. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, a bank robbery son, right, I guess. All right, all right, what's next, dude? The Ford Focus slash Fiesta automatic transmission. And guys, this is the power shift, and this is a nightmare. Yeah, they use the power shift, uh, dry clutch packs, not wet. Uh, there's a class action lawsuit, uh, Ford agreed to extend the warranty to seven years. You know who had one of these? Uh, um, gosh, what's his name? Chad. Chad, yeah, Chad had one of these. Yeah, and he had a problem too. I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah. basically, one, if you have one of these uh, uh, Ford Focus or Fiesta automatic with the power shift, uh, it's guaranteed to fail. It is. It's, it's something that uh, a very close friend of mine who borrowed, had a lease on this car and it really died uh, in a horrible way. And it's like the cliche. He was in the middle of the desert. He didn't have a signal on his phone. And the transmission completely locked up. And it was a complete and utter failure. And Ford has made the agreement. And they no longer build this transmission, by the way. They, 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 this is gone. And the whole point of it initially was to make a simple transmission that was inexpensive, kind of along the lines of a CVT, but something that's sportier and very economical. And it was. It was all those things. And it was really, really unreliable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a black eye for Ford. Uh, I think they were early to the dual clutch, uh, and um, I think they. Uh, I think I don't know what happened. I don't want to speculate, but uh, it, it just never worked. Uh, and it, you know, I mean, these things. Some of these things would die, like the next vehicle on our list. And we can talk about that. Yeah, might as well uh, go right to it. Yeah, it's so number seven is the uh, Mini Cooper CVT, the R50 generation, uh, which is um, the pre 2006 Mini Cooper non S. I uh, had a ZF CVT, uh, and that was guaranteed to fail within the first 100,000 miles. It, they wouldn't it, make it 100,000. Well, it wouldn't make it 100,000 miles. Yeah. It was a guaranteed failure. It was one of the few cars where you could say pretty much you will have a transmission failure of some sort with this CVT. And this is the first generation of the new Mini, and unfortunately, they were horrible. And it's a real shame because the manual transmission version of it was actually pretty reliable and pretty robust. And I can tell you that because half the crew owns one right now. <laughs> and unlike the Ford, though, you could actually drive this thing potentially to like 90,000 miles before it would fail. Maybe. The Ford would fail within the first like 30,000 yeah, miles. Yeah, in most cases it would, even if you babied it. it. Unfortunately, both transmissions were really, really bad. 
and you must stay away from those if you find one that hasn't been recalled and repaired. A class action lawsuit, again, just like uh, the Ford. Mm -hmm. uh, a mini issued a recall to replace a bad transmission, but this expired in 2014, and the replacement cost uh, $4,595 on Mini Mania. Yeah, and you know what? I think it's those even more expensive worth. now. I think it's actually gone up in price because remember, you have to have this thing installed. Yeah, Mini Mania <laughs> is like a, it's a it's a part supplier for minis, uh, but yeah, it's it the, the vehicle is not worth four and a half thousand dollars. Not even close. Yeah, no, no, it's just 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 forget it, guys. Move on to something else, but don't move on to the Fiat 500L. That's number six. <laughs> Tommy put just a crappy car, new or used. <laughs> so my aunt-in-law, yeah. my, my wife's aunt, has one. Okay, tell so me what, about it. Uh, real quickly, what happened was uh, she was looking for a new car. This is right when it came out, and I gave her a list. And at the time, you know, Toyota Matrix, other stuff like that was sort of on that list still. And so she had a list of like 10 different cars, and I put it on the list because it was a new car that just recently came out that, you know, she found interesting. She's an artist, and so she thought that it looked really funky and unique, which it does. And it has a nice-looking interior, which it does. And it has fiat quality issues, which it does. And it has, like, it, it, right now, she still owns it. She actually had the hood wrapped because the hood was rusting. She lives in Santa Monica. Sure. And so she had to have that wrapped just to hide that. It's still under warranty. She listened to me and got the extended warranty, thank God. And she's taken it in a little too often, honestly. So far, transmission has somehow managed, but there are some electronic gremlins in it. And this is just one example. It, it didn't help the brand that they brought this in. I mean... It was a bad idea, and they it, it barely a, sold yeah, it. Yeah, it was a bad idea. I think they were struggling for cars. And, and let's face it, the Fiat, the Fiat, the 124, is mm. great, right? It's a good car. It's I think that car. the original 500 that the they Abarth, brought here... Yeah, or the, is a wonderful car. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what other Fiat? Oh, uh, and the little... Uh, five, X. Yeah, the X is a fine car. Yeah, the Fiat 500 the X. Sister brother. So actually, the Fiat 500 X should have been introduced instead of the L. Yeah. It would have been a better seller, especially if they had a couple different versions of it. And unfortunately, the U.S. just never got enough Fiats and enough backup to make these vehicles viable. The original, the original, the U.S. spec Fiat 500, even the Abarth, really good little car, not too bad with... Um, Reliability, provided that you get the manual transmission and don't do anything too fancy. All right, we're going to do another one of these. Okay. Right, this is, uh, I'm going to read what the book says uh, as, a, as a shout out to uh, the author who sent us this. Thank you very much. I am a Jeep Wrangler. You'll probably find me at the beach with my doors and roof off and a puppy in the seat. I'm a truck that, can, uh, that anyone can drive. People say that riding in me makes them feel alive. I'd agree with all that. I would agree with all that. Or sometimes I'm, you find me on the roof at the bottom of a canyon when somebody <laughs> doesn't heed the warnings on you some switch. You can't read that to a to a, like a five year old. That might explain why my kids are a little screwed all up. All right, here you go. So uh, here's your choice. Okay. All right. Uh, Jeep Wrangler, uh, Dodge Viper. <laughs> okay. Or uh, Ferrari. And I, I apologize. I don't know my Ferraris, uh, so I'm gonna not tell you which one it is. It looks like one of the more modern ones. Okay. Here you go. Okay. All right. Here's here, here's the sound. I'll give you a hint. Sounds a little truck-like. Yeah, that sounds like the Viper. Very good. Yeah, yeah you got the Viper. Yeah, yeah. It, and and if because uh, I can see the cover of the book from yeah. here, and that looks like an Enzo from. Oh, I, very good. So it is an Enzo. Yeah, yeah. maybe it is. I, I and I'm not wearing my glasses. Should, should I play the Enzo? Should sure. We, let's, let's see what the Enzo sounds like. Did it have a flat yeah. plane crank, like a flat plane crank? Yeah, yeah, and then when he revs, when yeah, revving is where you can really tell. Right, I got to listen to the Jeep. Okay. All right, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like. Is it, is it the Jeep. four liter? Yeah, it no, be, it's, it's, it sounds think, like, sounds like three, a modern one. Yeah, you think it's a three six yeah. Pentastar? Yeah, which sounds the same on every single car that it's in. Which All right, is a million different cars. All right, so, so dude, you came back from Florida, yes, where you had a chance uh, to get behind the wheel of a Tesla powered Defender. Is that right? That is correct. So tell uh, me about the company. Tell me about what they do. T just walk me through what happened. Uh, so I was lucky enough to be invited, and this is the second time I've been there, okay. to ECD. ECD is East Coast Defender. Um, they are an auto builder based in Kissimmee, Florida, so near Orlando. Yep. Uh, they're just about to open their brand new facility, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But they've been around since 2013. They've got about you know, 50 people on their crew, and they turn out about 50-ish um, cars per year. Now, here's the cool part. What they do is they import, usually from England, a platform to a 25-year or older uh, Land Rover Defender. 
Okay. And it's a variety of different types. It could be the 90, it could be the 110, 130, the 127, all these so different the platforms. the pickup truck. Right, the, all, all that all, stuff. All that, yeah. Right. And these clients have them ship it in and they strip it all the way down. So it's just the platform and then they build it all the way up. That means new components throughout and it's bespoke. So if Roman wanted, let's say, red and black interior because he loves red and black, they would do that with whatever leather. If he wanted it from a Bentley, they'll put it in there. Not cheap. These things are extremely expensive. They start in the high ones and usually go well into a quarter million dollars. However, every stitch you basically say, I want. Okay, so that's what they do. They, it's a bespoke uh, coach builder, essentially. And one of the things they do, and one of the things I got to sample more often than not, which is awesome, is they take big V8s and they drop them in these things. So imagine an old Defender with like a modern v8 oh yeah modern v8 a supercharged v8 i actually drove a defender 90 that had a um 650 horsepower v8 in it it was doing wheelies pretty much wow and that let's face it it needed that because those things were (laughs) slow from the factory well the cool thing is but that's what these guys do they'll actually put in a variety of different engines i think right now they have eight choices so a bunch of v8s they put in a diesel if you want a little four-cylinder cummins they also have the original Rover engines, which, of course, they shrug and say, look, if you really want the original, we'll do it. So they'll do the a little, what is it, 2.4 Cummins? I, I always forget what the... I think it's a 2.4 point four Cummins. Four, and point eight. You get, I'm sure somebody will correct me in the comments if I got it wrong. Which is a, it's, it's a really good powertrain, a very simple powertrain, and some people do it. And the thing is, is that they can build them up and make them into a big family hauler, and they're unique because, yeah, you could buy a G-Wagon for the same money, but not many people have these fully built up ones. So, okay, but now they, you have but the But they're premise. not cheap, right? These New, are... as I said, they go in the high ones. Essentially, you're going to be paying over two hundred grand if you want one. And the one that I drove was well over a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. And the reason why is because rather than putting a big V8 in there or supercharged engine or anything else, they took a Land, uh, Land Rover Defender 130. It's a beautiful blue one. And they put in a Tesla powertrain. So, essentially, 400 horsepower... And they say 220 miles range, and this thing is drivable, man. I, I jumped in it. I drove it around. Uh, I did not get a chance to go off-road with it because it's the middle of Florida. And yeah, other no, than dropping it in the swamp, there's not, not a lot of off-roading. In no, but there will be. And this is the thing, and uh, I, this is a shout-out to ECD because they are pretty cool guys. Their new facility will have an off-road center on their property so their clients can go and test these things out. And so when they open... When they have this thing going, we will go back there and do a proper video where we're going off-road, which is what we do. And that'll be really cool. They expect to build about 10 of these per year. So it's going to make up nearly a quarter of the vehicles that they produce. And this vehicle worked. It it was unusual, though. There were some unusual quirks about it. I just want to quickly mention those. Yeah, like what? Okay. For one thing, currently, they're only able to do level one and two charging. There's no fast charging available on this. Even though it's a Tesla battery, cannot hook up to a Tesla facility. So you can't do that. Yeah, Tesla disables that. Yeah, exactly. They don't like you using when a vehicle is either written off or, you know, um, salvage title, they will not allow you then to charge it. Right. And so the components that they got was actually, uh, there's a company in England that does I should this. I say fast charge it. I should yeah, say charge. they're, they're fast charging. Super charger, yeah. You can't so you plug it in at home and you basically charge right. it up overnight. Now, according to them, they say 220 miles range. I'm thinking it's a little bit less than that, being that this vehicle weighs as much as a school bus. Do but you know, Do you know how, how many kilowatt hours the battery was? Uh, no, I don't uh, have it uh, written on me. But the thing is, is that there's a couple different options that you can Did put you out there. Did you do a story there. on it? Is it over? Uh, yeah, it's over. Uh, if you go to tflcar.com. There's a full story on it, and that has the details and or, some of the... Or TFL-Studios. Or TFL-Studios, yeah. that's correct. So, so, so you've got all the details. There. Right, right. And uh, just to wrap up in terms of this vehicles and its capability and everything else, what they did was they took the electric motor from a Tesla, and they hooked it directly to the drivetrain. So they went past the transmission. So it's one speed. And that means that you still have the four-wheel drive function of the original Land Rover. And they'll build it. If you want lockers, they'll build lockers, open diff, so they'll did, do open diff. So did they connect it to the uh, transfer case? Yes. Okay. Directly to it. Okay, gotcha. Directly to so it. So they bypassed the transmission and put it on the it transfer Completely. Case. So okay. it's a one speed, just like a Tesla. Right. And it drives a little unusual, but it will move really, really quick. And it's a little, it takes a little bit of time to get used to. Now, here's the weird part. They actually had to put in electric power steering, which they did a really good job on, by the way, and they had to have other types of pumps running electrically. So you can hear all that when you're driving, but you don't hear anything else. And because of that, it kind of sounds almost like driving a golf cart down the street or something. It's silent. You hear a little bit of a whine. 
and then you hear the pumps <laughs> and that's it. So fortunately, you have a killer sound system which can take care of that. Uh, overall, the vehicle is very drivable, but remember, it's a Land Rover Defender, which means it has the turning radius of the Missouri Battleship. Right. Yeah. Well, so, well, thank you, ECD. You said right. Yeah, ECD, and and they they really are great guys. I, I do recommend looking at the TFLcar.com uh, story. Yeah, check it out. And uh, ECD, thank you very much for. Uh, Letting Nathan go out there and experience an uh, all-electric uh, Land Rover. That's pretty badass. It's pretty badass. And, and there are other Land Rover built ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's – and one more thing. Uh, I did – as I said, I drove the Land Rover, uh, their old – which was like a 1986 or whatever platform, but it's all brand new. And it had like an LT4 supercharged V8 in there. They used GM V8s, supercharged, 650 horsepower on a really short wheelbase. This thing will absolutely destroy anything I can think of that is currently built for off-roading. So, so which one would you get if you won the lottery tomorrow, the electric one or the V8 one? I would get a V8, but I wouldn't get that. That's just too much horsepower. I hate saying too much, but I, you know, on such a short platform, when you have 650 horsepower, it's too much. So I would take that vehicle, have it stretched out to the 110, or here's something, Roman. What if they built the Tesla version on a 127 platform, which is their pickup, one of their pickup truck platforms, yep. put the Tesla in it. That means they would beat Elon Musk to building an electric Tesla-powered pickup truck. Yeah. That just blew my own mind. <laughs> oh, Elon's going to be ticked when I mention that. All right, so Na- all right. do it, ECD. All right, Nathan. I'm going to give you... Uh, G- gonna, give me another one, I'll and then we'll go back to the list. I'll give you a hard one this time, okay? Yes. All right, so let's go uh, 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 GTR. Okay. Okay. Uh, R8. Okay. Or NSX. Ooh. GTR, R8, Audi R8, or Acura NSX. Okay, really important. Is it the old NSX or the new NSX? It's the new NSX. Uh, okay. Okay, right, now I know, to, I know to listen Ready to. Listen? Right, here we go. Oh, that sounds like an Audi. The GTR. GTR. Okay. GTR, you were close. Do you want to hear the Audi? Yeah. All right, All right here's the Audi R8. It could have the 8 or the 10. We don't know. right? That's I bet you it's it, the 10. It came with two engine choices. So yeah, we don't know yeah. Which one. And we've driven both, by the way. We have old TFL videos. Man, that was, that was a great car. It sounded, they, yeah, I, I could see how I screwed it up. Sorry, Nissan fans, I screwed up. All right, let's keep going, dude. Um, number five on our list of top 10 used cars. You should never buy Jeep Compass 2007 to 2011. First-gen Compass based on the old Dodge Calibra, I'm sorry, caliber, uh, front wheel or all wheel drive, Jetco CVT, just a very uninspired, you know, kind of a, a, a car where they decided to use the Jeep brand uh, and make a lot of money using the Jeep brand and not necessarily giving the car uh, all the Jeep uh, DNA. Yeah, it didn't have the Jeep proper Jeep cachet, despite what certain people would say. And the thing about this vehicle that you should keep in mind is that the platform was actually co developed with Hyundai and Mitsubishi. So it underpinned a ton of different vehicles, including the Dodge Caliber, which all of them were not very good. Well, it and underpinned a ton of rental vehicles. Oh, I think it, yeah. The, Boy, the there fleet. were a lot of rental fleets back in the, uh, yeah. Um, the Jacko CVT, as I'm sure you guys know, major disaster with that. Not very good, especially back then. They have improved them. But what Jeep did is that they went to the CVT. They realized it was a bad idea, and they eventually got out of it and went to a different transmission. So the later um, Compass and uh, Patriot, they're basically the same vehicle uh, underneath. Those were better. So the 2007 to 2011s, they did have a manual transmission one too, by the way, Roman. But still, the interior quality, a lot of that stuff was just terrible. Talk about like like your definition of hard, greasy plastics. <laughs> they they had you know this is Daimler Ma- times and Ma- all that mouse Things, for seats. <laughs> yeah, they, they had they had a lot of issues, and they were trying to build a vehicle that people could enter the Jeep brand with, and that like, was the point of the Compass. Basic. It, uh, remember those LED displays, right? You know oh, what I God. mean—the little yeah. dot matrix. It was it, it was horrible, uh, like uh, speedometer, right? That would like the plot, most plot. It looked like something you would buy at Target. It was a very generic vehicle, and it did have later on, as I said, the bones got better, and they actually did improve them as much as they could, you know, to get a return on their investment. But the earlier ones are are, are really dreadful, and I highly recommend that you. Put on your special hat and avoid them, despite the cachet you may have heard about in some old commercial, which is irrelevant. Now, now, number four is another car that is, I think it's being discontinued this year, but it kind of falls in that same uh, class uh, as the Fiat 500L, and that is, of course, the Ford Eco, or do you say Eco Sport? 
They call it Echo Sport, and this has been a. I remember, remember when they, the lady said it, and I was debating her when when they came out from Ford, and I said. Echo is a repeating sound as opposed to eco. I don't, I don't understand. Think they, I don't think Ford themselves know because no. half the people I talk to at Ford go eco, the other half go echo. I know. So it, it, they, they, they're not on the same page about it. Now, for those of you who don't know, we're talking about a very small crossover, essentially the size of a Fiat, or sorry, Fiat, of a uh, Ford Fiesta, but built taller. When it initially was uh, hinted to come here, they had a spare tire hanging off the back, kind of Jeep like, and it looked kind of cool. I think it looks kind of cool, unfortunately. The bones underneath are just not great, and it was really built for a third world market, and they well, tried to built, make it better. It's built in India. Yeah, it was designed I mean, for not, not, nothing India. wrong with cars built in India. No, nothing not wrong with cars built in Mexico. We're not trying to like this any cars like that. But, I, but you're right. I mean, it was it was a Ford needed to compete in that compact four wheel drive segment, right? Yeah, like it's, with the Honda HRV and whatnot. Right. Yeah, and they, and so you know the the Renegade, right? And mm-hmm. so they needed something quick, and this car was available, and they decided to import it. Uh, but it just feels tinny, uh, and it's expensive, dude. You think that's some, my issue? With they're it. like they can get up to twenty six, twenty seven thousand easily, easily. And and unfortunately, you are talking about a vehicle that isn't really competitive with the ones that it goes up against. Uh, they're just better vehicles. They do sell them. They still sell. Just not a lot, but it's just not as good as Ford can be, and especially when you see something like the Ford uh, Bronco Sport, you know which is only of, slightly bigger. You know what a lot of Ford, yeah, it's a great The great Ford Bronco Sport is awesome. Yeah, and, uh, like, like night and day, but you know what a lot of dealers do with them? They put them in their, like, uh, temporary, like, loaner fleet. Yes. And then give them to you when you go and have your whatever serviced, and then they sell them as used vehicles. That's a mm-hmm. very popular thing I've seen done with them. Uh, but yeah, they're they're you know they're kind of starter cars, but there's just so many better starter cars in that same uh, segment. Yeah, I mean, uh, and you have new ones coming out like the Toyota Corolla Cross, which is infinitely better than this. So keep in mind that this is just it's just one of those that Ford kind of dropped the ball on, and now they have something better to replace it. So I would just look at a Bronco Sport. Don't even All right, bother. I, I'm gonna do one more of these, and this is I don't blame you for not getting this because I couldn't get this, but I'll do the the, the three most expensive cars on here. Okay? okay, so we've got a McLaren, looks like probably a P1 or maybe a 570s. I'm not going to get. I don't know my McLarens. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very different though. Very different. All right, well, forget the McLaren. Let's okay. do the let's 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 do the Lamborghini Huracan. Okay. Uh, Huracan versus Chiron versus Huayra. Oh, yeah, okay. Like almost impossible. Almost impossible, especially right. with it coming out of that little speaker. All right, here we go. Okay, that's oh. one. That's a Bugatti. Very good. Yeah. Bugatti, Chiron. Yeah, you got yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's, let's I, listen I, I to the uh, Huracan. I actually said the wrong car, but he thought I said the right car. Okay, go ahead. Oh, you said Huayra, did you? You want to hear the Huayra? Yeah. That's got a Mercedes engine. Yeah, that, that's what I thought I okay. was hearing. <laughs> All, right. All right, and then here's the Huracan. Actually, yeah, maybe. It's, you know, the, the problem with this is the speaker is just so small. That's my problem. As, as a it's, car person, it's hard to... You when know. you did that Mustang, it yeah. was like, okay, that's pretty much a Mustang because I could hear a burble. Yeah. But here's, these other ones... Here's a Mustang again. Yeah, that's definitely a Mustang. That. That is That very, is Mustang yeah, right there. Yeah, so that, that's how I was able to get that one. So, yeah, um, but the book itself is pretty cool. I wish my kid was younger so I could read it to him. At this point, he's stealing my books, and uh, adult books are no good for little kids. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, number three, Nathan. Uh, uh, this we is, know this one. This is an interesting one. We actually drove it. <laughs> it was one of the earliest videos we did. <laughs> yeah, Tesla Roadster, 2008 to 2012, uh, based on the Lotus platform, of course. So Tesla took a Lotus vehicle and then customized it to an all-electric car. 2,450 built. Uh, they couldn't sell all of them. Uh, I think they sold like 1,800. Uh, one just sold on Bring a Trailer for 190,000. And originally they were... Uh, depending on which model, between 100 and 150 thousand, very expensive, hard to maintain. Uh, can't um, supercharge them on the current network uh, because uh, uses a special charging plug. So this is before the Model S, before the X, before the J1772 the yeah. that was standard SAE that would sort every uh, everything now. So so I, mm. I know some people who've had these vehicles. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. So it's a hard one, right? Because Tesla is on fire right now, and so do you want to own the very first Tesla? 
Well, that would be the collection purpose of it, right? So yes, you could say, oh, I've got the very first thing that Elon made. Elon built a vehicle, if you want to give him the credit, which he doesn't quite deserve. The point is, is that this vehicle, which was built by others, is something that had a couple different transmissions in it because they at first weren't able to make it really work very well. I think they had a two-speed at first. Then and they, they went had to one-speed, I believe. Right, yeah. right. Um, and Roman and I drove one up and over... Whoa, oh, we were going Estes Park. We Estes went, Park, we peak to peak to Estes Park. Yeah, in and the we, snow with summer tires, summer tires on it, and, and we both were terrified. Of, yeah, and both of us. I mean, our shoulders are rubbing against a lot of uh, unnecessary man contact. The vehicle <laughs> yes. itself was quick; it was really, really fast. Yeah, yeah, but it was really rough around the edges, and it was just a step away from a kit car, as far as I was concerned, in terms of its overall quality. Which I mean, it's a Lotus to begin with, the Lotus Elise, uh, basically. So, yeah, really the only reason that I would buy one is if I had a ridiculous amount of money and I wa- wanted to say on record, well, this is the first vehicle that they produced. Yeah, you know, um, the other issue with them is, and I'm, I'm learning this as we get deeper into electric cars, you know, we have that new channel, TFL EV. Uh, for the most part, electric car batteries have, a, you know, a very gradual decline in their uh, power output, right? Sure. So it's usually, people have done studies, you know, Tesla's been around now, what? 12 years, something like that, something like as that, long yeah. as we have, basically. And it's usually, well, 2008, essentially. Is yeah, I mean. yeah, and it's usually like, it's about 1% to 2% a year uh, in their ability to hold a charge, mm-hmm. which isn't a lot, right? No. And so it's this slow decline, and then you get to like year 8, and it just falls off a cliff. For some reason, you know, you only have so many charge and discharge cycles, mm-hmm. and at like 8 years old, and I don't know how many cycles that is, all of a sudden the power dramatically decreases. And so then you need to basically, the, the battery is still good at that point, for like a Tesla Powerwall, right? Mm -hmm. Something that doesn't need as much power as an electric car. So it still has life, but it no longer functions very well for an electric car. And so you get like eight to 10 years of life out of them. And, you know, these things are beyond eight to 10 years old. And the other issue with them is uh, parts. You know, they only built 2,500 of them. Where where do you get parts? It's it's not like, you know, you're going to get parts for this thing. I went uh, to our local Tesla uh, uh, service center, right, when we bought the Model Y, and I asked them, what do you do with these things when people take them in trade? And they said they actually take them, uh, and then they disassemble them and then use them for parts for others that are still out there, which makes sense. It makes total sense, considering, you know, how much someone's willing to pay to keep their collector car going. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I honestly wouldn't, even if I had a ridiculous amount of money, I don't think I'd get one of these just because I know what it is. And it's it's an early experiment. Remember, he had Elon Musk actually had to approach the people who had put down the deposit of the vehicle and say, I need more money for, from you in order to actually produce this vehicle that you already paid for. And they said yes. And that's how he was able to produce it. And this vehicle did launch Tesla into the world's consciousness, either good or bad, because you call you know, Top Gear and whatnot, didn't really like it very much. But it did lead to the S, and the S was a hell of a success. Yeah, uh, so, you know, uh, Jalopnik has been doing this series, like people who paid way too much money for cars on Bring a Trailer. Recently, uh, like an Integra Type R sold for, oh I think, God. over 100000 I, I, I don't want to be like... I'm precise, but it was definitely over 100,000. Yeah, yeah, it was over 100K. Uh, And and, uh, and the numbers that people are now paying for these vehicles, and the same thing, of course, this car, like I said, 190,000, I'm bringing a trailer. And I think to myself, Nathan, I could buy my dream fleet of 10 cars. Seriously, I could buy my dream fleet of 10 cars and have money left over uh, as a down payment on, like, a summer house. I could get 20 cars with yeah. down payment on some I, I, shack. You know, I don't think that, I don't think, let's say, a hundred and plus thousand dollar Integra R is going to make you any happier than like that $18,000 Golf R we just bought. It is, yeah. It's not. It's just not. I would agree with you, but the other side of it is, and there's a lot of collectors out there who are specifically looking for that car. Well, it's also, and, they become commodities, right? Right. They, people are buying them no longer because they want to drive them or because they love cars, but they're seeing, like with watches, that these are investments and that they're tripling, quadrupling in price. Mm-hmm. And so now people are buying them not because they have a passion for cars but because they have a passion for making money which is fine and it's been like that for a long time if you look at some of the exotics out there yes but from a car guy and gal standpoint of view $190,000, one hundred ninety thousand dollars. I, 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 ten cars, all under twenty thousand. I could probably name them right now, and I'd be so much happier. And I'd still have money left over to fix them up, to maintain them, to store them, and to buy my summer house. Right. And if you were a huge EV fan and you love Tesla, as many do, then it would make a little bit more sense. And then you know your arguments no longer you know 
you know, let's go on to the next how about, one. Though. How about you buy the first Model S, which at some point might actually be just as collectible, because that's really the first real car. I actually know somebody with a very early Model S. And those are actually probably, you know, more like in the, let's say, $30,000 range at this point. You know, other than interior issues, he's had the thing for about seven years or six years or Uh-oh. something like that, and it's been dead reliable. Yeah. Yeah, he hasn't had any real major problems, according to him. But he's also a bit of a cult fan when it comes to Elon Musk. So, right, before you go to number two, can yes? I do my Roman's rant? Oh, Roman's rant time. Yeah, fire Roman's it up, guys. Uh, Buckle I think, up. I think you'll appreciate this. Please. So, as you know, we've had the uh, Raptor um, 37 the newest Raptor, the third-gen Raptor here at the office. Right. Uh, and the previous Raptor, uh, Andre and I went on the program, and it had these Recaros that I could not stand. I just could not stand them. They were so tight that I, my big-ass American butt did not fit into them. They were miserable. Mm-hmm. Uh, the amount of, like, space there was n- nonsensical for me. I'm sure if you were Lewis Hamilton, you'd be happy in them, but I'm not Lewis Hamilton. And so, so this one also has their car wheels. They're better. I can mm-hmm. sit in them. Oh, good. But my rant is, why do manufacturers, and I'm talking to you, Honda, with the Type R. I'm even talking to you, Porsche, with your sports seats. Why do they build these sports seats for, like, people like Lewis Hamilton's or Tommy's body type? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, for the longest time, women would complain that all of the beautiful dresses were built uh, were, were designed and sized for, like, a size 6 mm-hmm. or maybe a size 0. Why? If in America, right, Tommy's not buying the Raptor. He's not. Right? His generation, millennials that weigh 120 pounds, aren't buying this. No, they're buying buying the Raptor are me and you. Yeah. Think about this. Why can't you design a Recaro that is wider, that actually fits somebody of mine and your stature and body type? In other words. Does it have to be, you know, made for Lewis Hamilton? Right, right. We need thickness, folks. You need to be able to support our girth and our thickness. Wow, that sounds horrible. So we actually know somebody who works at Recaro. We do. Yes, yes, we really do. Yeah, she's great. Uh, she, she is great. Uh, but it's not just Recaro. There are other seat companies out there, and there are the automakers who use these seats. And the bottom line is, if you look at a cross-section of Americans who go and buy your badass pickup trucks, and I'm talking about every single automaker out there, a majority of them are not going to be tiny little people. There could be a few of them who are pretty big or maybe past 50 or even 60 years old as such. Maybe let themselves go a little bit right here. And that means that we need more space. And I agree with Roman 100% on that. Yeah, why not just build a wider Recaro that, that fits some, and not just Recaro, any sports seat. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they're all designed, let's face it, for Paul, our, our race car driver. He's like 5'4 and, you know, has like two ounces of... A fat on him. That's yeah, it. he's like a 140 pounds something. Yeah, yeah, type R. He fits into like a dream, right? He's a former Stig, so yeah. he's you know, and that's you know, I know, I get I, it. You dude, know, I was just in a race suit. I'm the Michelin Man. You put me in a race suit. I am literally the Michelin Man. I'm the safe puff marshmallow man. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit even larger than that. But you know, th- this is a, an interesting thing, guys, because a lot of seats out there are becoming better. That they, they they massage, they heat, they cool, they do all this. Yeah, they do do that. But what about these sports seats that don't quite fit some of the girthier drivers out there? Think about that. Yeah, look, like, I mean, like you can make an argument that a Type R, right, Civic Type R, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, man. You know, that's a, that's a young person's vehicle. Uh, and so you could probably guess that younger people are probably going to be not as uh, – uh, wide in their stature, as and some of them are. Yeah. But you know, that why would you? Why would you then? You know, sell a forty-five thousand dollars vehicle to people who can only you know afford uh, to eat at McDonald's, which not, means not, they, not, they not, suddenly become larger and need that seat anyway. Yeah, I, it's, it's not a. It's not like a. You know, I, I'm sure there are a lot of millennials who are billionaires. You know, crypto billionaires out there. But oh, for yeah. the most part. People who are buying Raptors and these very sport, even Porsches, these very sporty cars are going to be older. They're going to be, you know, bigger and wider. So stop designing. Just design the seat bigger. Make it bigger. Make a little bit bigger. Yeah. And yes, still make it grip people. In fact, I know for a fact that for years now, automakers have been selling seats that can be adjusted, sport seats. So you can actually take certain components and bring them in and bring them out. Why not do that with these sports seats so you have like a skinny mode and a... Not so skinny mode. You know, I'll give you a car that was killed, not because of the seats, but because of this very same issue. Hmm. I remember when the last generation Viper came out, right? It only came out with a manual transmission. Yes, which I loved. Which we loved, yeah. But I'm I'm thinking to myself, no, you know, the guys who've got a hundred and whatever twenty thousand dollars to buy these things are not going to be twenty year olds. They're going to be sixty and seventy year olds. And let's face it, that transmission was very heavy. 
Yeah, I loved it. But it was, he's right, it was heavy. And, and, and the point you're getting at, of course, is that there are a lot of guys out there who really don't want to row their own gears. And when they're spending the money on this, they want to be seen in this car, but they really don't want to have to shift it. And that is what happened to Corvette and an awful lot of other vehicles. Where's the proof? Look at the majority of transmissions that are currently being put on every sports car that's made. Most of them are automatics of some sort, so you don't have to figure out how to be El Macho and actually shift them on your own. All right, let's do one last one. Okay, let's do it. I'm going to put the only four cylinders, so there's an Acura Integra. Mm -hmm. Speaking Uh, of which. I think it's an Integra. I think it's an Integra. (laughs) Read those pages. Here. Integra? What do you think? Uh, No, that looks like a Honda. Um, the European version of the uh, SI. Anyway, it's probably a four-cylinder. Yeah. Right. Whatever I'm, it is, it's a four-cylinder. Okay. It says, it doesn't tell you what it is. I wonder if there's a, is there a cheat thing in the back here? <laughs> wow. Uh, no, there is. We're okay. car experts, folks. So, um, or, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that, the other ones are easier. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make this easy. So, I think that's the only four-cylinder I'm seeing in here. Okay. Uh, so, let's go with, um, let's see here. Let's see, what else should I pick? Oh, Hummer. Okay. okay. Now, is this which Hummer is this? H two, H one. It's an H two. I'll show you the. I'll show you the Hummer. Okay, because that, that's a big go. difference. H. Okay. H two. I think it's an H two. Here. Yeah, it looks like an H two. So H2. Andre, so probably a six liter. All right, so a Hummer H two. So that's going from uh, and then an Aston Martin, DB seven, I believe. DB seven. Okay, you ready? Okay, yeah. Uh, or something like a DB seven. These pictures are a little. They're made for kids. All right, all right, ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm going to hit the button. You tell me what this is. Do it again. All right, hold on. I'll, it's I'll, definitely I'll, not a Honda. It is a Honda. That's the force. That's the Honda? Yeah, here's the Hummer. And here's the Aston. Okay, so oh, the Aston's the only one I would have gotten. That's a little raspy. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Otherwise, those other two, the four cylinder. Did I say girthy? Can you describe <laughs> an exhaust as girthy? I, I think you say, can. I, yeah, I, I've said girthy more than once, and I'm really <laughs> worried that someone's going to listen to this and think I'm trying to be rude, and I'm really not trying to be. Uh, right. So I'm, out of all those, I, I totally blew that one. But it really, the Honda did sound a lot like a V8. All right, number two, Nathan. <laughs> okay. Uh, the BMW X5, the 4.4 liter, same with the Range Rover uh, with from 2002 to 2006. So uh, the 4.4 liter has been very problematic, called the N62. They suffer major oil burning problems. When the valve, stel, valve stem seals fail, a coolant mm. crossover pipe would leak. Uh, buried deep in the engine, 40 plus hours to replace. So, what do you think? The original BMW X5 with the 4.4 liter V8. Not the straight six. No, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, the 4.4 liter V8, by the way, when it runs right, is an extraordinary oh, engine. It's incredible. Not only that, but the Range Rover that has that BMW V8, they're highly sought after. But yep. you just read what Tommy put out there, and the fact is, is that they have been known to have some oil issues and they have been known to have some other leakage issues. So not a cheap vehicle to replace, not a cheap engine to replace. So, so I bought one of those uh, first generation X5. Yes, but I think you had the six cylinder, didn't you? But it had the six. I think it was a three liter, right? That was definitely a three. Yeah, liter. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and I, I remember one of our headlights went out. And luckily, I bought like you did the extended mm. warranty. The right. C, it was CPO'd actually. So CPO'd. The headlight itself to replace was fourteen hundred dollars. Are you kidding me? No, fourteen hundred dollars <laughs> for the headlight. And then. Uh, uh, for some reason, I, I knew this. The little uh, knob that turned on the radio also uh, fell off, uh-huh. and the head unit alone would have been like a thousand bucks, which Jeez. wasn't CPO. By the way, the CPO did not cover the radio; it covered the headlight, but not the radio. Yeah, yeah. This is a BMW CPO. Yes, and that, that's actually something I'm going through right now with our Mini, which is a very similar type of program. Certain components are covered and certain components are not. But when it comes to the BMW 4.4 liter V8, among other engines, BMWs, unfortunately, they're not known for being particularly robust over time. They're known for being problematic. And there are electronic gremlins and there are some quality issues that still haunt them. And by the way, for all of you uh, youngsters out there, CPO stands for Certified Pre-Owned. So these are vehicles like the one we bought probably came off of a lease, and then mm-hmm. BMW uh, does, and most manufacturers do this, a, 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 like a, a inspection program. 100-point inspection. Yeah, and like then that. they extend the warranty, you know, another 50,000 miles, two years or something. Right. So, and these programs are not all the same, by the way. CPO can be really, really good, and it's usually something I recommend before buying a new car. 
Or in some cases, look at the fine print because they may not cover everything, just like uh, the volume control knob. All right, and number one, Nathan, on our list is uh, the Volkswagen first-gen Touareg, mm -hmm. but the V10 diesel. Uh, one of our favorite cars, uh, the V10 had over 500 pound-foot of torque. Uh, but, Nathan, very expensive to maintain. Oh, yeah. Engine was too big for this car. I agree. Too big. It was too big to the point to where maintaining it and doing certain types of repairs required some crazy acrobatics to get it out. A car starter is an engine out replacement. Holy cow. You had to pull the engine out to replace the, the starter. What the hell? <laughs> and that, I think, is at least a $2,000 <laughs> just to pull the engine. Yeah. If you can find a VW dealer that has the right... Like you, I think, if I recall right, you had to have special dealers that could actually work on these vehicles because they were so hard to work on. Right. Um, and then, of course, dual batteries, so expensive to replace. Uh, we had the uh, V8 Touareg, uh, and the battery was under the passenger seat. It was just, to, just to, not the battery, just to replace it because you had to take the whole seat off. Mm -hmm. was $200, just, just the labor to get at the battery. So over an hour's labor to pull off the seat, put the battery in there, and put because the seat back Because it's powered, on. right? Whereas, yeah. uh, you know, a regular battery to replace would take, what, 10 minutes, 5 if minutes? That, yeah, yeah, I mean, really wouldn't take long. So turbo failures. Yes. Uh, and, of course, center drive shaft bearing would fail. Did we have that problem? No, but that was because this one had too much it torque. It's super torquey. Yeah, right. so, so people love those vehicles. It's a, you know, it's a 10-cylinder uh, V10, which is badass. Then, then it, next generation, and I got to drive this by accident in Europe, they went to a V8 which we never got. And then, of course, the generation after that. You mean a V8 diesel. Diesel, yeah, yeah. I'm talking diesels here. Very good. Thank you for reminding me. And then the next generation, they went to that B6, B6 which yeah. was the uh, emissions problematic <laughs> yeah. one. One of, one of many uh, VW uh, powertrains that was a bit of an issue at the time. You actually drove the V8 diesel through Germany, right? Yeah, I got to drive it. It blew my. I, I got in it by accident and it blew my mind because I want to say that one had as much torque as a dually of the same generation. Probably. So it was like I was close to 800 pound foot of torque out of a V8. It was just a monster, uh, but uh, we never got it, unfortunately. Uh, we only got the following, the three liter, I think it was a three liter uh, V6 diesel, and that became the diesel gate one that, that eventually had to be, de so you can buy those, those are out there. Yeah. Uh, but if um, you didn't, if it wasn't bought back and it was repaired, basically, because they didn't use DEF fluid, right? Volkswagen came out with its black magic where they said that the engine would get so hot that it would burn it, off it, the... Yeah, it would, it would use heat to, to burn off the particulates. Right, which it didn't. Not, well, it did, but not to the extent that they to, had To, to make them clean. Right. And so the, the fix on that one, it was also, you know, in the Audi and all the other versions of it, was to basically detune it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is unfortunate. And there's still people out there who are huge fans of TDI uh, powertrains, and they buy these detuned cars, and maybe they add a little uh, little, little this and a little that to bring them back to their old power numbers. Uh, so the thing about the number one VW Touareg V10 diesel is the fact that the amount of money it costs just to maintain this vehicle and to fix it is astronomical, which is why it's number one on this list. Yeah, those cars, you know, for a long time they were like, let's say a regular V. So there were there was a V6, a, a V8, and then the 10. Yeah. And f first generation Touareg, and then for a long time those were like 10 to 15 thousand mm -hmm. dollar cars. And I don't know if they've gone up or not. I haven't been following them. Yeah, I, I avoid looking at them because the minute I, I find myself looking at a Touareg, I, I, I throw myself on the floor and scream. Because I loved the first generation. I thought the interior was one of the best interiors ever designed in a vehicle that was almost affordable. And then you find out, okay, it's got all these problems. I don't want to go there. And I love it so much. They're, they're great to drive. So, so earlier you, you kind of said and you did a video about it that you bought Tommy's Jeep uh, yeah. Grand Cherokee. How has that been treating him? Really good. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, the only issue it's having right now is um, I, I've fixed a couple minor things. Right. Um, the uh, heater is not great. The so heater core I, is starting to go. Right, right. So I took it in for a flush, which is the first thing you should do yeah. when you are when you think your heater core might be going because it might just be a clog. What, what year is it? Uh, 2001. Okay. Yeah. And I did take it in. I had it flush. And actually, the heater is working a little tiny bit better, but it's still not blowing very hot air. Uh, the, the vents are working, the fan's working, it's just that it's probably going to need a new heater core, and there is a cheat to get around that, and I may do it, but at this point, <laughs> my, my daughter's just like, Dad, can you just buy something newer that actually has everything working? Because she's the one who's driving it to school, yep. because her Nissan Leaf, which we talked about, can't really get through the thick snow. We just had a couple snowstorms back-to-back -back here in Denver. As such, that vehicle in snow, fantastic. 
the four wheel drive system, the the, the part time yeah. is absolutely perfect. Tires on it, it's got the KM3s. They're mm -hmm. a little bit more suited for off roading. Yeah, they are. But I, well, my kid knows how to drive a heavy vehicle. She's driven trucks in snow before, so she did just fine. She says it's great. And the heated seat can actually cook your pelvis. Yeah, the heated seat works. So it really, at least on the butt, the seats are. Good. Oh my god! <laughs> so it's great. It's great. I, I'm thrilled. I, I'm a cheapskate. I like to buy old used vehicles, keep them running as long as possible, so I'm not making big car payments, and then eventually save up and get myself something new, which I'm waiting about another year and a half to two years. As the market dies down, then I'll do it. And before we uh, end this, um, let's talk about the Easter Jeep Safari. Yes, it's coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. I very can't excited. believe it. Yeah, very soon. Uh, so are we going? Yes, we are. We okay. are going. We actually talked to Jeep briefly, and they are going to be doing it every year, with one exception, when it's the first COVID year. We, TFL, goes to the Easter Jeep Safari. For those of you who don't know, that is an event that is combined for off-road enthusiasts during Easter, basically in April for the most part. And this year, just like all other years, Jeep will have some prototypes and some concept vehicles that we will be allowed to drive. That's the really cool part. And sometimes they're pretty awesome and they indicate what they're thinking about and sometimes what's going to be built in the future. Yeah, we got an email from one of our viewers uh, or listeners who has uh, an AEV. Did mm -hmm. you see that email? No, I didn't see the I thought AEV. I forwarded it to you. I'll forward it to you. Anyway, he wants us to take a ride, and it, it, he's going to be there the whole time. And I said, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's obviously a Cummins. I think it's maybe not a Cummins. I don't know. It's a, it's definitely a, a Ram, you know, that they've converted. AEV is done up. AEV is known for massive, badass, brutal off-road conversions. So I can't wait to actually get behind the wheel of that, hopefully, or at least feature it. Uh, and I can't wait to get to Moab. Uh, we're kind of in what I consider the deepest, darkest part of winter right now. Right, because it's <laughs> it's been so cold and snowy, so that's always the greatest sign of spring when we start talking Easter Jeep Safari. Yeah, and so if you guys are curious, it is uh, coming up in April and pretty close to around Easter time, and we will probably have a Jeep Week of some sort or something along those lines. And stay tuned. That's going to be on TFL Off Road, maybe on TFL Truck, TFL Now, TFL Car, probably. It's going to be everywhere. See you guys next time. Ciao. Cheers.